Now, in this video, I'm going to give you a demo and show you the step-by-step -step process that I personally do when it comes to sketching out my storyboards. We're simply only going to focus on shapes. There's going to be no color. I'm only going to be using very simplified information. Now, if you look at the first three panels that I've drawn, starting from the left to the right, uh, the triangle is on the first page. That is our introduction to Goldilocks. So I've just shown that by simply drawing a triangle, nothing else. So that particular page is going to be devoted to me introducing the reader to Goldilocks. So if you aren't familiar with the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, let me quickly review it for you. The story is just basically that Goldilocks goes off into the forest one day and she ends up getting lost. While she's out there, she finds this house and she basically goes inside and nobody's at home. This house belongs to the Three Bears. Once she's inside, she notices three bowls of porridge on a table. One is for Papa Bear, one is for Mama Bear, and one is for Baby Bear. And from this scene onwards is where I will start designing out the panels uh, so that you can see exactly how I go about doing this. Now on page 11 and 12, I want to just show as though Goldilocks is about to enter the house. So I want to just draw her in front of the doorway and I'm using the entire spread in this case. I'm not dividing up the pages like I did uh, in the previous uh, six pages. So now we're going with page 11 and 12 being one entire spread. And we're having her kind of look in and I want to have a window showing on page 12 as well. So that is going to kind of be, you know, when I draw that, that's going to be the foreshadowing showing the porridge inside the house. So, uh, and I'm going to put a little tree also on the right. So this is to still indicate that we are outside and not inside. And also take a look at my layers window on the bottom right. Notice how each panel, each page has its own number. And this is a really good way for me to help keep track of what is where. Otherwise, my whole scene is going to be so incredibly chaotic and we don't want that. And of course, you know, I'm always using any kind of different filters that I possibly can. If something needs to be on multiply, I make it on multiply. I usually use darker shapes when I want to show something in the foreground and lighter shapes when I want to show something in the background. Okay, so now let's move on to the next spread. We're going to focus on pages 13 and 14 and I'm going to make them, you know, one big illustration, a whole spread going across the two pages. And in this one, I want to show Goldilocks entering the house and seeing the three bowls of porridge on the table in front of her. And it's, you know, the way I'm going to illustrate it is it feels like it's two different pages. So I'm going to have a lot of information on page 13, a lot of information on page 14. But the middle part of the book, the seam, the line, that blue line that you see going down the middle, I want to make sure not to add too much information there. So even though it is one giant spread going across, the information is still, you know, kept contained on uh, either side of the page. And, you know, I want to kind of also keep this repetitiveness where I always mostly show Goldilocks on the left page. So when, you know, the reader is going to open the book, I will kind of show her more on the left side and then the other information will kind of be on the right side or, you know, whatever the leftover information is. Because in the end, I always want Goldilocks to be the focal point. And also it creates a sense of flow. In the story so the reader kind of always knows that when they turn the page this is going to be there like they will always see goldilocks on this side so you know this is something to think about you don't have to do this but this is something i choose to do especially considering people do end up reading their information at least you know the english language you know we tend to read from left to right so i want to kind of keep that in mind when i'm drawing out uh, or designing out my panels now let's take a look again at pages 13 and 14. Notice how I have changed the angle a bit. I've made it more diagonal. Now on page 11 and 12 and pretty much every other panel, everything was very simple. Uh, everything was very straight, dead on. But what I did was is by adding in these angles, I've just made it a little more dramatic. 
the tone of the story has changed, right? Uh, now Goldilocks is entering like this unknown domain and she's discovering all these new things. So the drama is up, the ante is up. So I want to subtly show that by just, you know, adding in more angular shapes, by just creating a space uh, that goes across the panels, but has uh, has some drama to it. It's not just the straight, you know, horizontal lines. Whenever you draw very straight, squarish shapes, it can show a sense of stability. Uh, but when you add in or change those lines, they almost instantly give you a sense of, uh, not discomfort, but it means that, you know, something has changed, something is not, you know, it's not what it was before. So it also creates, it also gives the illusion that this is a separate space, that this is a new environment as well. And it also makes it more visually interesting for the reader. So now I've gone ahead and drawn in a table on the right, and I've drawn in the bowls of porridge as well, and I'm just using very simple shapes. I just drew two ovals. The dark oval represents the plate, the light oval will represent the porridge in it, and of course we have the triangle as Goldilocks, and you know, she's just looking on at the porridge. She's discovering the porridge as she's entered the house, and you know, I, as I mentioned, I gave that foreshadowing on page 12. I'm going to kind of give an indication of the table with the porridge on page 12. Okay, so now on pages 15 and 16, I'm going to really change up and add more drama. I'm going to create a point of view design. And by point of view, I mean like the reader's point of view, almost as though the reader is up high above looking in down at what is going on. So in this uh, particular spread for pages 15 and 16, I want to draw Goldilocks actually eating the porridge and tasting it and trying it out. And if you remember the story, she tries Papa Bear, she doesn't like it, she tries Mama Bear's and she hates it, and then she tries baby bears, and she loves it and just eats everything up. So I want to show that process right there. So as you can tell, I've drawn the triangle on page 15, and it's very hard, of course, with these kind of shapes to indicate that we're showing the top of uh, Goldilocks's head, but I want to revisit this panel, which we will talk about in the next video, and you know, this will be the next step when we start adding and fleshing out more detail because sometimes this design process of using very simple shapes might not read very clearly. So you maybe want to go in there and do some actual sketches. So now if you look at what I've done on page 15, I've added Goldilocks and one of the porridge bowls next to her. And on page 16, I have Papa Bear's bowl and I have Baby Bear's bowl. So obviously Papa Bear's bowl is the biggest and Baby Bear's is the smallest. And, you know, maybe later on when I sketch this out, I'll add a few more things on the table to make it a lot more interesting. But for now, this gets my basic message across. Now on pages 17 and 18, I want to create another spread of showing Goldilocks finishing up Baby Bear's entire bowl. And what I want to do is, is this is the part where I want to add in more information on the three bears. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to create some frames in the background. And in those frames is where I would probably put some family portraits. So I want to create this very big grand table that goes across all the way from page 17 to 18. And again, add Goldilocks uh, on the left page with a lot of information. And I want to surround her with these family frame pictures that are going to be hanging on the walls. And what this does is this is also an introduction to the reader to be like, oh yeah, this is not our house. This house belongs to someone else. So we're also kind of unconsciously laying a seed in the reader's uh, mind to let them know, you know, that, hey, this, maybe what she's doing isn't the best thing right now. This is not her house. And this also gives the reader the first real introduction to the uh, bears. Also, please note that throughout this process, I know I'm using several tools that I have not explained properly yet. So, you know, I am using the brush tool whenever I want to lay down a plate. Very simple, like I'm not 
going out of my way to create shapes or anything. I want to make this process as fast and efficient as possible for me. So whenever I'm creating circles, I'm using uh, the brush tool, the round one. When I want to create a frame, I use the pen tool. Uh, when I want to create uh, something very angular, I use the lasso tool. So it just depends. I'm varying from you know tool to tool. And again, I am using the eraser often to erase out any information that I think is unnecessary. And I do this very quickly by using those hot keys that I have on my keyboard. So for example, I will always hit um, E for eraser, B for brush, P for the pen tool, L for the lasso tool. So remember to keep all of this in mind. It'll make your uh, storyboarding process so much more faster. And a lot of times I'm using different layers for each and every shape. Uh, I'm taking the triangle of Goldilocks from another uh, page. I'll right click and then duplicate that and add it onto the next storyboard. And you know, this also just, you know, you can recreate the triangle over and over or make a brush out of it. I'm, I'm just doing this because it's my process. You don't have to do it exactly that way. Um, and of course, I also do use the hue and saturation to lighten things up very quickly. You can also lower the opacity of the layer, but then that might make you see uh, any uh, objects that are underneath that. If you hit Command or Control U on your keyboard, this brings up the properties uh, to adjust the hue saturation of the object you've selected. And I like to do that because it allows me to very quickly you know, make something lighter or darker. Now I'm just going to change the numbers to make sure that, you know, I have my spreads and my pages laid out clearly, especially when I'm using the same objects to go across two pages. I want to make sure that I label that properly. And, you know, I've added each of my layers into folders. So make sure you stay organized throughout this process. Otherwise it can become incredibly chaotic. And you know, now that I finished with page 17 and 18, let's move on to page 19. This is going to be the scene where Goldilocks um, finds out that there are three chairs in the house and she ends up sitting on Papa Bears and she hates it. She sits on Mama Bears and she doesn't like that either. And then she sits on Baby Bears. And of course, when she does that, she breaks the chair. So let's go ahead and start drawing out and designing those panels. So now for the design for pages 19 and 20, I'm going to go ahead and again use a spread. So we're going to have an image that goes across the entire uh, two pages. And what I want to do is I want to have an indication of the table that we saw on the previous panel, almost like a continuation, and then have Goldilocks in front of it staring at the three chairs that she will be sitting on. And by doing this, by adding that table in, I create like a form of continuity, you know, there's a flow to it. So, you know, it lets the reader know that we're still in the same environment and there's, you know, there isn't that disconnect, right? Like we're not completely taken out of the scene. It's almost like she turns around and she sees the chairs and uh, then, you know, we'll kind of take it and elaborate it from there. So now on a new layer, just using the lasso tool, I've just drawn out these very loose silhouettes of the chairs. Uh, the big one is obviously for Papa Bear, then the middle one is for Mama Bear, and the smallest one is for Baby Bear. And I'm just drawing in that table that you see on the left now. And now using the pen tool, I'm just gonna draw out a triangle uh, for Goldilocks. And I'm gonna make sure that she's kind of in front of the table so that, you know, it gives us an idea of perspective and depth. Now for pages 21 and 22, what I want to do is a montage of Goldilocks trying on the different chairs. However, before I go ahead and do any more changes, let me just fix the page numbers. As you can see, I have incorrectly labeled them. All right, now that I have fixed those page numbers, let's go in and design our page. So what I wanna do is, is I wanna create like a sort of montage. And for those of you who don't know what a montage is, it's almost like a series of events that happen one after the other. And uh, it, it, you see this often in movies, you know, for example, when you see an actress uh, trying on several clothes 
at a store or something like that. So that would be a montage. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to have uh, Goldilocks first try on uh, and sit on the big chair, Papa Bear's chair. And then I'm going to have her kind of travel toward Mama Bear's chair and then finally end up in Baby Bear's chair. And the way I'm doing this and showing this is very simple. I don't want to make this too chaotic. I like to kind of play with that negative space. Um, you know, it's we're not completely taking our uh, reader out of the environment, but we're maybe we're we're making this particular scene in the story a little more entertaining. And if you have watched my previous Tudpat course that I did on uh, the character design for Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you would know that. Uh, I have created my story so that Goldilocks herself is not a human, but rather she's an animal, more specifically a cat. And the reason I did this is because I just wanted to create a universe where everyone was an animal. I think it'll just, it just makes it a little more fun. Uh, so what I'm doing is, is um, in my design, when I'm showing that indication of Goldilocks uh, trying on the different chairs, I want to kind of add these very cute small paw prints uh, that give an indication of her, you know, walking around from chair to chair. And, you know, this may not make sense, but it's also a way for the reader to fill in the blanks, right? It doesn't make sense. Uh, but again, it's a fairy tale, so it's meant to be a little more fun. So when I actually go into illustrating this particular scene, those little dots that you see will actually be paw prints. Now, what happens in the next scene after Goldilocks tries on all the three chairs, she finally ends up in Baby Bear's chair. And what she does is she breaks his chair. Um, so that's very sad. So I want to make this particular scene very iconic. So I, I'm going to divide up the pages now. So we're not going to have a full spread. What I want to do is I want to give one entire page just devoted to that moment where the chair is broken and Goldilocks is staring at it. So that is another very pivotal part of the story. So first she eats all of Baby Bear's porridge and now she breaks his chair. And on page 24, we're going to add in a little more detail. I want to go ahead and add in a staircase to indicate that she is, will be leaving that environment and going to another room. Now I'm going to hit Command or Control T on my keyboard so that I can rotate the chair to indicate that it's broken. And I'm just going to, uh, you know, draw these small dots there again to show that maybe the um, the leg of the chair is broken off. And then I'll just draw a triangle next to it to indicate that Goldilocks is staring on like, oh my gosh, what did I do? So I actually tried to lay it out so that the entire thing was one scene or maybe the two scenes were merging together as in the scene the first scene being where the chair breaks and the second scene being where she goes up the stairs uh, but i don't necessarily think that works So, you know, I'm just testing out to see if this will work. See, this is where storyboarding is so helpful because it's helping me decide before adding in too much effort whether something is going to work or not. Right now, this staircase just feels very awkward. It's such a big mass uh, that's taking up so much of the page and I, I could really use that space for something much more efficient. So therefore, that is why I'm not going to go for a spread uh, for this particular uh, scene. You know, I tried putting two Goldilockses there just to show that maybe she broke the chair and then she's going up the stairs, but that, that just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It's going to be too confusing for the reader. So now using the uh, lasso marquee tool as well as the transformations, I'm going to create a staircase um, that is going to be much more taller and maybe won't use up as much space. And now this is where I'm going to divide up the scene. So we're going to have two different pages with two separate um, uh, instances happening.
So I think I'm happy with page 23, but I still think 24 needs some work. Like for example, if I try and show that um, Goldilocks is going up the stairs, it seems kind of awkward. The composition with both the pages together like that don't make sense. It doesn't feel very interesting. Uh, the space is just very confusing. So I'm going to fix that. I think that we need to make the staircase a lot thinner, a lot shorter. And I want to make uh, Goldilocks herself much smaller as well, especially in this particular scene. So the reason I'm creating such a difference in scale here is because I want to show this almost as um, the introduction before she's about to enter a new space, right? Uh, like for example, when I showed Goldilocks in the forest in the in on page six, I made a very small Goldilocks with a very big set of trees in the background. This is just to show how big that forest is that she's about to enter and to show that you know she could get lost. And it also just makes for an interesting composition. When you show something um, that can be very overwhelming to a character, uh, it makes for a more interesting visual because in this case, it seems foreboding, right? And if you remember the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, uh, this is the scene where she goes upstairs and ends up sleeping in everyone's beds. And of course, the Three Bears find her eventually in Baby Bear's bed where she's sleeping comfortably. And that is where, you know, everything goes wrong. So this is almost like that foreboding. It's like she's going to go up those stairs and it's like, uh oh, you know, the scene is changing, the pacing is changing and the story's going to change now a little bit. Right now, it's not going to be Goldilocks by herself anymore. Now to go ahead and fill up that big white space above the staircase, I've added these interesting shapes. Now, I'm not sure what I want them to be at the moment. I want them to either be windows or um, frames. What I was thinking of what might be fun is if they were tapestries. So one tapestry for Papa Bear, one for Mama Bear, and one for Baby Bear. And again, this is me, uh, again, emphasizing, reminding the reader that she is not in the house that she's supposed to be in. This is not her home. This belongs to someone else. So wherever you get a chance uh, to show that, I want to, especially after she just broke Baby Bear's chair. So in the next scene, as you see her go up the stairs, um, it's a nice reminder uh, to, you know, to the reader to know that, okay, this this is going to eventually not end well, right? Because eventually these characters are going to run into each other. So it's almost again, like I mentioned earlier, planting that seed again in our reader's mind to remind them of what is happening in the story. So now for pages 25 and 26, um, what we're going to have is Goldilocks will be on the left and I'm just going to loosely draw out some silhouettes of the beds. And, you know, this is like looking forward directly at the bed. We have uh, Papa Bear on the left and then we'll have Mama Bear that's slightly smaller and then Baby Bear will be all the way to the right. Now, I want to create a montage similar to what I did in pages 21 and 22, but I'm only going to do it on page 27 here. So this is going to be divided into two pages now. It's not going to be one continuous spread. Uh, we're going to have a montage where the uh, Goldilocks will try on all the three different beds. And then finally, on page 28, I'm going to have her sleeping in Baby Bear's bed, and we're going to have the three bears coming back home. So initially, when I was sketching out the composition for these pages, I tried to do it so that I would have, um, you know, I could have an, one entire spread, but that wouldn't make sense because the beds are quite big, right? And if I were to try and draw a bed in the middle, that wouldn't make sense. Remember, we want to keep as less information as possible between our pages. That line that you see in the middle is going to be where your book will bend. So we don't want to add too much information there because the reader won't, will not be able to see properly. 
So I've tried laying it out so that, you know, the two beds are on the left and that there is one in the middle, but I don't think that reads very well clearly. And I think that it's just too much information at this stage. I really want to speed up the action, uh, speed up the drama uh, while we're heading toward the end of the book. So what I want to do is, is I want to create it so that all that little action where she's trying out the bed is on one page and then the scene where she's sleeping in her bed and the bears are coming will be on page 28. So what I'm going to do is again I'm just going to draw out the bed loosely and then just draw a triangle of her sleeping on it. Now on page 27 we did like a top down view and the reason I chose this is because I think it'll be a little more interesting when you're showing the bed from the side. Uh, it's very hard to give it a little character but when you're looking top down I think I can add much more information and the reason I also did it top down is if you can see those swirly lines that are on the bed on page 27, it's supposed to indicate that the bed sheets have been pulled down. So you want to show that. You want to show that she slept in all the beds. So that's why I'm going with a top down view in this case. Now I'm just visiting pages 25 and 26 again because I think on page 28, what I want to do is, is I want to create a some sort of foreshadowing that is going to show that the three bears are coming. So what I want to do is, is I want, almost want to have a window on top of the bed. And this window will basically show us uh, the three bears coming home. And I want to draw like a much wider window because I think that'll be, you know, a much clearer uh, visual of them heading home. I think if the window's too small, it might not read very clearly. So I'm going to put this big wide window right above Baby Bear's bed. Now I just duplicated the layer which uh, had the key with all the characters on it. And I just moved that layer down into my page folder. And just using the same one, I'm going to... Um, go ahead and add it in my window. Okay, so now we have it so that on page 28, we're showing Goldilocks sleeping in bed and in the window above her, we can see the three bears heading home. So now we only have about, let's see, eight pages left to tell the climax of the story. So now for pages 29 and 30, what I want to do is, is just kind of focus on the bears coming home and realizing that somebody has visited their house without their knowledge. Now I'm going to go ahead and use the same drawings that were on pages 13 and 14 where um, Goldilocks had just entered the house and I'm going to take that same set of shapes and I'm going to play with them for pages 29 and 30 because they're the same room and I just want to create a little bit of uh, uh, I guess uh, similarity right we want to remind the reader that this is we're back in an environment that we were earlier on in the book So as you can see, I'm just trying different things right now. Again, I've taken the same uh, shapes and elements that were on pages 13 and 14, and I'm revamping them for page 29 and 30. Uh, but I want to I want to keep the scene different, but the environment the same. So I'm going to try some different things and see what works. I want to put the bears uh, now into this environment and see if that makes for a good composition. So I also want to try out um, another scene. This is going to be, a, a, this scene I think will be a little funny for me. I want to have it so that that big long table is right in front of the bears and they're just staring at their empty porridge bowls. So I want to create like a very dramatic, almost very still image. You know, it's almost like that shock, like that um, 
the 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 realization that something very wrong is happened that some stranger is in their house so i want to give a moment uh, to the characters to kind of absorb <laughs> what is going on in that particular scene so this scene is going to be very straight uh, so that's why I'm just having the straight table across and I'm just going to draw the three bears in the background staring at those bowls. Now, I think that page 29 doesn't flow very well into page 30. I think that big divide of the table kind of cuts off uh, in the middle of the page and I don't really like that. So what I think I'm going to do in this case is I am going to flip uh, the scene. So I'm not completely changing the environment, but what I'm going to do is, is I want to show it in a different angle. Now I think that this works really well because first of all it creates a nice space between the two pages so it shows that there's a nice divide between the characters, uh, there's a nice sense of flow and also by showing this from a different angle it's almost like the reader is looking at it from the bear's point of view. So when we were when the table was shifted the other way we had Goldilocks coming in and looking at it and now when we have the table on the other angle we kind of have the bears uh, coming out and looking at it. So I've just I've switched it around a little bit so it changes the scene and again it doesn't change the environment. Now in pages 31 and 32 I'm just going to keep it very simple. I don't want to add in uh, too much into the scene and I, we want this to keep moving very fast. I want the pacing to be faster. There's more action at this end. It's more thrilling, right? Because uh, Goldilocks is eventually going to be found out. So for page 31, I'm just going to do a very simple uh, design where we're just going to have the three chairs and the third chair is going to be broken. And again, I really like that positioning of just having the three bears standing together and just staring at what has happened to their house. Um, this, this, along with the reader, um, it really allows, you know, you to go into the um, kind of, you're kind of going into the mind of what the bears are going through, right? They're taking you on a journey with them. So by having these very still moments of them just looking at what is going on in their house, uh, it takes the reader into that moment as well. You guys actually, the reader actually has the opportunity to take in the damage uh, along with the bears. And now for page 32, I'm going to repeat the exact same uh, storyboard that I had for page 24. I'm just going to drag and drop that down here because I want to repeat the same scene again. Uh, this is again to bring back uh, that repetition. So the reader is reliving these scenes again, right? They, re they lived it through Goldilocks and now they're reliving the moment through the bears as well. So now I'm just going to lay out the three bears so that they sh that it looks like they're climbing up the stairs one at a time. So we're just going to move baby bear up front, then mama bear, and then papa bear. And I like that uh, gradual shape uh, change from small to large so that, you know, your eye kind of starts somewhere on the top and then it just zooms down toward the bottom. Now in the final four pages is going to be where the bulk of our action happens. So on pages 33 and 34, I simply want to show the bears coming up into their bedroom and noticing that Goldilocks is sleeping in their bed. So this is again just going to be a very kind of eerie uh, interaction between all the characters. They're going to just stare at her sleeping on page 33, kind of absorbing in like, oh my gosh, so this is the intruder that has been in our house. And I'm just going to create a, a very almost um, 
simple image where it's just going to be a bed like the big uh, a side view of the entire bed and i want to have it so that baby bear is sitting on the bed post on the top left and then mama bear and papa bear are just staring on from behind the bed so that way we get a full view of all the characters so we'll have goldilocks sleeping in the foreground the parents in the background and then baby bear along with her on the left Now I'm just going to darken baby bear a little bit or the circle that represents baby bear so that uh, he, you know he stands out more in the foreground and I'll do the same for Goldilocks as well. This is so that you know later on when I'm drawing the scene makes sense to me. Otherwise if you're looking at it it's just going to be like you know what what is that. So make sure that when you're doing these designs that you yourself are very clear on what is going on in that scene. Now on page 34, we're changing the camera angle so that the bottom of the bed where her feet would be are facing the reader that are that is facing us. And I'm going to have it so that her head is just peeking out from under the covers and the bears are essentially staring at her. So she's awake. Uh, they know that she's in the house. She knows that they know <laughs> that she's in the house. So this is a very like pivotal moment where everybody is basically facing each other off. So as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the using of shapes doesn't read very clearly. So I might go back and sketch out this scene a little with a little more detail because right now when I look at it, it probably doesn't make as good sense as I'd like it to. Uh, but this happens, you know, uh, sometimes the shape, uh, the, the technique for using shapes works and sometimes in some cases it doesn't. So now we are on our final page. So this is essentially the standoff. We're going to have it so that Goldilocks is no longer in her bed and she's just staring at both uh, Papa Bear, Mama Bear and also Baby Bear. And uh, they're essentially having their standoff. And in this case, you know, when I'd have the text, I'd have them all kind of scolding her. Uh, if I were to flesh out this illustration, obviously I'd draw them with very angry, upset faces and Goldilocks would be full of fear. Uh, her face would be, you know, like, oh my gosh, uh, I've been caught. And I also just wanted to go with creating a very simple scene. I didn't want to add, again, too much information in the scene. Like I said, again, this is for much younger kids. And uh, this is a very dramatic uh, ending to the story. So we don't want to overwhelm them with too much information. So I just want to keep the focus, uh, that interaction between all the characters. So I'm not going to add any other information anywhere else. And of course, finally, in the last panel, I'm just going to draw out Goldilocks running away from the house. I'm going to use the same house that was there on page nine. And we're just going to have a very small indication, a uh, small triangle that is showing that Goldilocks is leaving the house and that she is no longer there. And that's pretty much it. That's how I want to wrap up the entire book. I don't want to add in too much information. There was a lot of action uh, that happened toward the end. And we're just going to, you know, I just want to end it so that it shows her leaving. And after that, you know, we don't need to see uh, the aftermath of how the bears reacted. Obviously, we know that they're upset. And I also know that once Goldilocks leaves, pretty much all they're going to do is going to be cleaning up the house. So we don't need to add any of that information. The reader can fill in the blanks over there. So now let's take a look at my storyboard designs that I've done. Uh, if you look at it as a whole, let's really just pay attention to how everything is flowing, if everything makes sense, if there's any changes I want to make. So this technique is something that I always use before I begin even sketching out uh, any kind of drawings on the paper. So. You know, once you have finished with this stage, in the next and final video, I'm going to show you how to slowly go ahead and start adding in some detailed sketches uh, to your designs.
If you remember earlier on in the video, I mentioned that if there are any panels that don't make sense, uh, you know, with this technique that we're using, the best thing to do is to just go in there and do some light sketches so that you understand what you're drawing. Otherwise, it would really, it would be more of a hindrance and a time waster if you don't really know what you're drawing. Now in the next and final video, I'm just going to focus on showing you how to add in some sketches to certain parts of your storyboards that don't make sense.